That was full screen. All right, so so this uh, will be the continuation of frequency mod of the frequency modulation tutorial. So I'm going to try to finish all the frequency modulation questions today, okay? And then on Monday we will cover the rest of the questions that we haven't covered. So stuff about random processes and probability and all that stuff, and then noise analysis too. So I'll try to finish all those questions on the Monday, okay? So that way you won't have to come in on the on the Tuesday. Okay, so here's the question that we have. So we have a frequency modulated signal of, you know, this is the expression for it, which we all, which we all know, okay? And then the carrier frequency is two pi times, or, you know, the carrier frequency in terms of hertz is simply 10 to the 7 hertz, or 10 megahertz. Also, the deviation, this is not specified. So it's actually in hertz per volt. So you don't have to divide by two pi when you're done. But um, in the final exam, I will make sure that it's in radians per second so you know. So when you actually calculate the deviation, you make sure you have to divide by two pi. Okay, so the message signal is a little unconventional. So instead of like being a cosine wave and all that, it's actually uh, a weighted, uh, it's a weighted exponential. Okay, so we have two questions there that I have to answer. First, we have to calculate the maximum frequency deviation of the mess, you know, of the frequency modulated wave. And then we have to figure out what the bandwidth would be. And then we use this definition of bandwidth because this is actually not a band limited signal. Right? So it, it actually, if you actually take a look at this Fourier transform, it's actually a, uh, it's a non band limited signal. So we have to impose some sort of, um, some sort of condition to figure out what the bandwidth is. We'll talk about that later. Let's actually, stock, let's actually talk about the first question first here. So let's actually calculate what the frequency deviation is. So if you remember from the lecture, so the frequency deviation is KF m of p. But we don't divide by 2 pi because this is in hertz. So in hertz, therefore, don't divide by 2 pi. Okay, so you don't need to do that. The reason why you divide by 2 pi customarily is because the coefficient k of f, which is the sensitivity, is usually in radians per second. But here it's in hertz. Here it's actually uh, in hertz, so you don't have to divide by 2 pi. Okay, so this is already known. So we know this is 10 to the 7. But then how do we figure out what this is? How do we figure out what the peak is? We usually, with a cosine wave, you can pick out what the peak is immediately. It's just whatever the height of the message would be. But this particular case, we actually don't know what the maximum height is going to be. So how, how, going back way to maybe first or second year, how exactly do you find where exactly the largest value in a function occurs? Do you remember? Take the derivative, right? Take the derivative find what the critical points are, and then the critical point will tell you the location of where the maximum will be. So then once you figure out where the location is, you substitute that into your function, then you find what the actual height will be. Remember critical points, find the derivative set equals zero. You'll, okay, well, that's what you're supposed to do. All right? So to find the peak, find its location by setting not setting, but finding the derivative of the message and figuring out exactly where the slope would be equal to zero. That's how you find the maximum and the minimum, right? You're trying to find the points in your function where the slope is zero or the derivative is zero. So you want to find those locations. Once you figure out where those locations are, you substitute that into your original function to figure out what the actual height of that at that time point would be, okay? So if this is my message, right, they gave it to us, this is 10 to the 6 and t e to the minus 1,000 t, okay? This goes back right to first year calculus, unfortunately. So we see there that we have a product of two functions. So when you have a product of two functions, you remember there's the product rule, right? So if I let this be u, and if I let this be v, right? If I want to find what the derivative is, it's what? It's equal to u prime v plus v prime U, right? Well, that's how you find the derivative, right? So, okay, so if I want to find the derivative of this, right? Okay, so this factor 10 to the 6 stays outside. And then, remember, if I let u be t, if I take the derivative of t, it's simply 1, right? And then I just write out the exponential term by itself, okay? And then plus, I need to take the derivative of v. So if you take the derivative of this exponential, it becomes minus 1,000, e to the minus 1,000 t, right? And then multiply this by t again, v prime u, right? And you want to set this equal to 0. So if you set this equal to 0, oh, what's going to happen is that this constant 10 to the 6 goes away because you can divide both sides by 10 to the 6, it's fine. And then what will happen here is that 
my, my derivative, if I set this equal to zero, I get e to the thousand t, and then plus t. Sorry, not plus t. So what I can do is I can bring this over to the other side over here. So this becomes this equals the negative goes away. So I have a thousand t e to the minus a thousand t. Okay, and then notice that I have common factor of e to the ten thousand e to the thousand. So I can cancel this. So then I'm left with one equals a thousand t. So t is simply one over a thousand or one millisecond. Okay, so that is the time at which the maximum occurs. Okay, so this is the time, sorry, time at which max occurs. Okay, so if I were to figure what the actual peak would be, I just have to simply substitute one millisecond into my message. Okay, so therefore, MP is simply the message at one over a thousand. Okay, if you remember, this was 10 to the sixth, one over a thousand, and then e to the minus a thousand, and then one over a thousand. Okay, so then what's going to happen is the thousands and the thousands cancel. This becomes 10 to the sixth divided by a thousand, which becomes 10 to the three. So this becomes e to the minus one. So this would be your peak of the message. It's a thousand times e to the minus one, or one divided by 2.78, okay? So therefore, if I want to figure out what the deviation would be, it's simply kf m of p, right? And kf we figured out was, uh, let me see here, it was uh, 10 to the three, I think, hold on a minute, let me see, what, what was it? It was, uh, yeah, 10 e, actually. So you're gonna have 10 e times 10 to the three, e to the minus 1. So the e's cancel, and then you're left with 10 to the 4, which is 10 kilohertz. Okay, so that would be your frequency devi that would be the max frequency deviation. It's simply 10 kilohertz, or 10 to the 4. All right, does that make sense? Okay, so that's done. Let's do the next question. So the next question is to determine the bandwidth using Carson's rule, and for the message signal bandwidth, you want to use what's known as the 6 dB bandwidth specification. So what this is telling you is that you have to find the frequency where it's, it's, it's the frequency that gives you the DC value of the magnitude divided by four. So you have to figure out what frequency will give you this relationship, okay? So, what you have, so that's what we have to do. So our message signal, if you recall, was equal to 10 to the six T E to the 1000 T, okay? There is a Fourier transform on the, your Fourier transform pairs on the actual table that you get in the formula sheet which has the following property. So if you have t to the minus at, if you take the Fourier transform, it depends on which domain you look at. If you want to take a look at it in terms of f, for example, this becomes 1 over a plus j 2 pi f squared. Okay? Or if you want to take a look at it in terms of omega, this becomes 1 over a plus j omega squared. Okay, so that would be the Fourier transform. So remember, when you want to find the bandwidth, what you do is you, fi you find the Fourier transform and you see the most highest non-zero frequency component in your signal. Okay, so that would be the actual, but in this case, this actual uh, Fourier transform is actually uh, non-band limited. So it actually carries on forever. So what you have to do is you have to use this Fourier transform. You have to find out what the magnitude is. You set that equal to zero and then you determine, you know, so you, you determine what the magnitude is, you set that equal to one over four, not one over four, you set that equal to whatever the DC, DC value is over four and then you solve for it, okay? All right, so let's see here, so the magnitude. Uh, okay, so we have this relationship. We have to determine that the, uh, let me see here. So we have to satisfy this relationship. Okay, so this is the relationship we need to satisfy. So whatever frequency gives you this value, that is what we need, okay? So I have to figure out what the magnitude of this would be. Okay, so how do you figure out what the magnitude is? Well, if you wanna, okay, so here's a shortcut for you. So if you wanna figure out what the magnitude is, uh, let's see here. So um, let's see, yeah, magnitude, that's fine. All right, so, um, okay, so if you actually find what the magnitude is, so we need to find M of, Let's do omega for now, okay? Actually, not omega. So what we'll do now is, so I have this. If I have a 10 to the six here, then I'm gonna have a 10 to the six here, as well as a 10 to the six here. Let me just get that constant out of the way, all right? Also, 
This is equal to 1,000, all right? So remember, this would be 1,000, and that'll be 1,000 as well, all right? So I'm just, I'm just making sure that everything is the same here. So once I have this, okay, sorry, I'm just going over here. All right, let me just double check. Yep, N04, okay, good. Just wanted to double check what I have here, so one over four, yep, all right. So what you want to do is uh, you have to find the frequency where the Mag, you know the magnitude. You know the magnitude squared is divided by four. So um, what I need to do here, so you have to satisfy the magnitude actually. So first we have to figure out what the magnitude is. All right. If you want to figure out what the magnitude is, it's actually quite simple. Uh, what we can do is let's see. So um, I'll show you a little trick. If you wanted to find the magnitude squared, okay, it's simply equal to the message by itself multiplied by the conjugate. All right. You can do the same thing in terms of f as well if you wish. And then you can just take the square root when you're done. Okay. So when you actually go ahead and do this, all right, what will happen is uh, if you actually work this out by yourself, what you what you'll get here when you take the square root and everything, you get 10 to the six divided by 10 to the six plus omega squared. Or if you want to do it in terms of f, you get 10 to the six divided by 10 to the six plus four pi squared f squared, whichever whichever domain you want. So if you actually do this, if you carry this out, this is what the magnitude would be. And then what I need to do here is I have to figure out the right frequency where in the magnitude, if I set this equal, so right now, okay, so I have this magnitude, all right? So if I set this magnitude to be zero, what will happen is that, you know, the omegas become zero, so the magnitude actually becomes one. So what I need to do is I have to figure out the right frequency where in the magnitude it has to decay by a factor of four. So once I have, so therefore I need to make sure that my magnitude, okay, is going to be, and this is set to one, okay? So I need to figure out the right frequency that'll satisfy this relationship. Okay, so when I actually work this out, so what will happen is that I'm gonna get four times 10 to the six equals 10 to the six plus omega squared, okay? So when I factor this, or when I factor, when I solve this, this becomes square root three times 10 to the six, all right? And I want it in terms of f, so all I have to do is just take this quantity and divide it by 2 pi, all right? So if I divide this by 2 pi, right, what I'll get here is 275.66 hertz. Okay, so this would be what the bandwidth would be. So you figure out what frequency where when you take a look at the magnitude, it drops by a factor of 25%. That's, that would be defined as a 6 dB magnitude. So this would be the bandwidth. Okay, so if that's my bandwidth, then it's very easy now to calculate what the bandwidth of the frequency modulated signal will be using Carson's rule. So this is delta F plus B, okay? So delta F, in this case, was 10 kilohertz from, pre, from A. So this is 10 kilohertz from part A, okay? This is 275.66, okay? So if I actually go ahead and punch that in my calculator, I will get 20.551 kilohertz, okay? And that would be part B. So this is a little more complicated than what you're used to, but it's, the process is the same. So you have to figure out what the peak is, and then the bandwidth, they give you that definition, and then you just calculate it, you calculate the approximate bandwidth using Carson's rule. Okay? Any questions here? Okay, so I'll, I'll let you write that while I set up the next question. So I'll set up the next question, you guys keep writing that down. But this is the next question that I have for you. Okay, all right, here's the next question. We have a message signal that's actually a sync function, so in frequency domain, it's gonna be a rectangular function, rectangular pulse function. And we have a carrier with a height of 100, and we don't know what the carrier frequency is, but that doesn't matter, it doesn't matter for this question, okay? We also know that the modulation index is equal to six, so what that means is that beta is equal to six. That's what the modulation index indicates, all right? So the first question, Write the expression for the modulated signal f of mt. Okay, well that's pretty simple. You know that the frequency modulated signal is just, you're just modulating the carrier. So this becomes ac cosine, well not ac, we know that this is basically 100, so this is a of c. So we, this is 100, All right? So this is the carrier height, 100 cosine, let's see here, omega ct plus kf, this is the sensitivity constant, and you want to integrate 
your message, in this case, it is uh, 10 sync 400 lambda or alpha. We can do lambda and then d alpha. D lambda in this case, or alpha doesn't matter. What's whatever dummy constant you want to use. Okay, so that would be the message signal, or not the um, the modulated frequency wave. Okay, so that's pretty standard. All right. Okay, so next one. What is the maximum frequency deviation of this modulated signal? Okay, so how do you figure what the frequency deviation is? Well, there's two ways you can do this, right? The first way is if you wanted to calculate the maximum frequency deviation, it's kf mp over 2 pi, right? Or some, you know, assuming that kf is um, in terms of radians per second. But this, we don't know. Not given. So you unfortunately can't use this definition. What you can use, however, is you can use this. Alternatively, alternatively you can actually use this definition. So, uh, so remember, beta is equal to delta F over B. So this is the bandwidth, bandwidth of the message, OK? So we can use this instead, which is nice, because they give this, they give this to be 6. We have to solve this one. We don't know what this one is, right? But we, can't, we don't know what this one is either. This is the bandwidth of your message. But we can actually, we can actually figure that out, OK? So it's actually quite simple to do. All right. So there is a Fourier transform pair that you have on your, on your, you know, on your Fourier transform tables, which relates between a sync and a rectangular function. So this is what it is in terms of omega. So w over pi sync wt. The Fourier transform pair is rect omega over 2w. Okay? If you want to do this in terms of hertz, you certainly can. So this is 2b sync 2 pi bt. If you take the Fourier transform, this becomes rect f over 2b. Okay? So this is what we have. So this is our Fourier transform pair. Now, if you remember what our message signal was, okay, it was equal to 10 sync 400t. All right? It doesn't matter which definition you use. Um, let's see. So let's see. So for, it doesn't actually doesn't matter which one you use. So, uh, like, you know, if you want, we can use the omega one for now if you wish. So in this case, if you want to make this equal to this one, what you have to do is you have to make w equal 400. So w must equal 400. Okay. So in that case, what will happen is that you're going to have 400 divided by pi sync 400t. If you take the Fourier transform, you get rect omega divided by two times w, which is 800. OK? But then this is not exactly the same. This is equal to 10. So what I can do is I can multiply left and right by pi over 400. OK, in that case, this will cancel. And then additionally, I can multiply by 10. OK, so when I do that and multiply by 10, then I'll manage to get it. But it, it's just a scaling factor. It actually doesn't change the bandwidth. But if you actually really want to get it to be the same, then that's what you do. So in that case, this cancels, this cancels. You're left with a 10. And then you finally here, you get pi over 40 rect omega over 800. OK? So what, this, what does this actually look like? So this means that you have a rectangular function with a height of pi over 40, and that it spans between minus 400 and 400. OK? So this here, because this is a low pass signal, this here is our bandwidth. Oopsie. This here is our bandwidth. OK? So the bandwidth here, remember this is in radians. Okay, so bandwidth is 400 radians per second. But we want this in terms of hertz because the equations that are given to us are in hertz. So if you want, if you want to figure out what this is in hertz, you just have to divide by 2 pi, all right? So bandwidth in hertz is simply 400 divided by 2 pi, which is simply 1. It's just 200 over pi, okay? 200 over pi. Okay, so that would be the bandwidth. So you know what the modulation index is. So if beta is equal to 6. Therefore, you know that this relationship is the modulation in x. Okay? So this becomes 6 equals delta f, which I don't know, but I know the bandwidth is 200 over pi. Okay? So when I solve for delta f, right, when I bring this up above, right, delta f simply becomes what? It's just 6 times 200 over pi, which is 1,200 over pi hertz. Okay? And that's it. So it would be the frequency deviation for that.
Okay, does that make sense here? Okay, for sure? Okay, so I'll let you write that up and I'm gonna set up the next question. Or we're just plying through this. It's just, they're just calculation based. Okay, next one. But I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you write that down. Let me know, uh, are, you good before I, are, you good, are you good here before I proceed? Okay. Any questions with the last two questions so far? I think it's pretty straightforward, right? Okay, good. So I will make, I'll try to make, make it so that the difficulty of the final exam will be the same, roughly the same as what you see uh, for these tutorial questions. I learned my lesson the last time, so I'll, I'll, it'll, I will be sure to respect those rules th this time. All right? <laughs> okay. Here we go. So this is, this is we're going to branch off to uh, looking at indirect methods for FM signal generation. So remember how you generate an FM signal. A uh, frequency modulated signal through the indirect method is you start off with a narrow band frequency modulation. Modulations. You have an NBFM modulator, and then you use frequency multipliers and frequency mixers so that you convert that into a wide band frequency modulated signal. So that's the question that we're going to take a look at today. So a narrow band FM signal has a carrier frequency of 100 kilohertz, okay, with a deviation ratio of beta is equal to 0.5. Okay, that's great. So this here is f of c, right? And then this is our deviation ratio here. The bandwidth of the modulating signal is 5 kilohertz. So what this is telling us here is that the message bandwidth is 5 kilohertz. Okay, so what, when someone says a modulating signal, that is basically the signal that modulates the carrier, which is the message signal. So when someone says this is a modulating signal, what they mean is it's a message signal. Okay, so modulating signal is message signal because it is the signal that does the modulating of the carrier, which is what the message is supposed to do. It modulates the carrier. So when someone says, this is my modulating signal, what they mean is that this is my message signal. All right? So the bandwidth of your message signal is five kilohertz. And this signal is used to generate a wide band frequency modulated signal with a target deviation ratio of 10. So you're gonna go from 0 0.05 up to 10. Okay, so you're going from 0 0.05 up to 10 and a carrier frequency of 100 megahertz. So you want to change your carrier frequency going from 100 to 100 megahertz. So 100 kilohertz to 100 megahertz, okay? So here are the, so this, these are the, uh, this is the block diagram of what we want to achieve. Okay, so this is basically going from narrow band to uh, wide band. And here are the three questions that we, have to, that we have to answer. So the first question asks you, what is the required multiplication? What is the required value of n that you need for the multiplier? Okay. So that's actually very simple. So if you remember what the multiplier does, okay, if you, okay, so let's do a quick review. So the multiplier, if you have your signal that's coming in with a known carrier frequency and known frequency deviation, right? If you have some multiplier that is n, okay, the output will not only multiply your carrier frequency, but it also multiply your uh, frequency as well, okay? This actually correlates to the deviation ratio as well. So if your deviation ratio goes in, you actually have your deviation ratio multiplied by n as well. Why is that? Well, if you remember, the deviation ratio is defined as delta f divided by b, the bandwidth of your message, okay? This is constant, this doesn't change. So if my frequency deviation increases, then my deviation ratio is going to in increase as well. So as the frequency deviation increases, so does B. So does beta as well. Okay, so even though they give it to you as, your, as a deviation ratio, it's still the same. So this is what happens for the multiplier. When you have a mixer, right, what'll happen is that you'll have a carrier coming in, okay, and then if you have some mixer, so let's say, you know, you've got some mixer coming in here, so let's call this, you know, omega naught, okay. And then what's going to happen is that your output is going to be either either FC minus FO or FC plus FO, okay? But the deviation ratios or the, uh, the you know, the uh, maximum deviations will not change. So this becomes delta F and delta B. So does not change, doesn't change with mixer. Okay, so the reason why this is the important is because when you use a multiplier, both the carrier frequency and the deviation changes. When you use a mixer, 
you know, the carrier frequency changes, but the deviations do not change. So if you want to figure out what the right value of the multiplier you need, what you have to do is you have to take a look at the deviations because when you use a frequency mixer, what will happen is that, you know, you, should, you know, you have to figure out the right, you know, because what's happening here is that naturally you, pr you probably think to yourself, okay, if I want to go from 100 to, you know, 100 kilohertz to 100 megahertz, right? I would naturally think that I would just multiply this by, you know, 100 to go from 100 kilohertz to 100 megahertz. So that, you know, that's what I need. But if you multiply by 100, what you have to do is you also have to multiply the deviation ratios by 100 too. So you're going to go from 0 0.05. If you multiply by, by 100, you're going to get 5 instead of 10, and that's not right. So when you want to figure out the multiplication, you always use the deviation ratio because the carrier frequencies, when you're using the mixers, they will not change the deviation ratio. So if you want to actually figure out what the right multiplication that you're going to use, always use the deviation ratios because they never change regardless of the mixers. So we have mixers in here, so you have to make sure you use the deviation ratios. So therefore, for the value of n, okay, so it's simply the new deviation divided by the old because what's happening here is that you have a multiplier, right? So it's going to go from 0 0.05 to 10, but then when you have your mixer in here, that doesn't change. So this becomes 10 divided by 0 0.05, which is simply 200. So that's the multiplication we need, all right? So I satisfied the deviation ratio property, but when I multiply my carrier by 200, I'm going to go from 100 kilohertz to 200 megahertz, right? And, you know, that's not what I want. I want to, uh, I have to change it so that um, I want to generate, so these, because the output is a carrier frequency of 100 megahertz instead, all right? So that's actually what I need. So, so okay, so I'm not sorry. It's the that's not one one idea. I'm sorry. So the carrier frequency is 100. So what's happening here in a carrier frequency? Oh, I see. So let me see here. So local oscillator, that's fine. Okay, I see what's going on. My apologies. So this here, this local, so a carrier frequency is 100. So the new carrier frequency is going to be 100 megahertz. Okay, so let's actually run through this. So we have A, that's done. So B, what we need to do now is you have to figure out the two possible frequencies we need so that when you perform your frequency mixing, the output of this is going to be 100 megahertz. Okay, so we have to multiply by 200, right? So what's going to happen is that, so you have FC, this is your narrow band, this is equal to 100 kilohertz, right? Okay, and then you have your deviation ratio, narrow band, this is equal to 0 0.05. When you put it through your multiplier, right, what's going to happen is when you go to put it through 200, so 200 times 1 kilohertz would be 20 megahertz. So this is your new one, which is 20 megahertz. Okay? And then the new... Oopsie. Sorry, screwed up again. Sorry about that. This thing is really sensitive. Okay, so when you put this through your... So you have a multiplication of 200, right? So when you multiply your deviation ratio, what's going to happen is that this multiplies by 200, so this gives you 10, right? But this guy, this here, I need this to be 100. Okay? So what exactly do we need to do? So remember, when you're doing frequency mixing, there's two possible frequencies you need. So two possible frequencies. Okay? There is the carrier minus, you know, the uh, input that's coming in. Okay, I have to make sure that the output is 100. Also, when I add this, it has to be 100 as well. So there's two possible frequencies you can mix, right? Either plus or minus. And then I'm going to impose a absolute sign here because, you know, uh, cosine has is an even function. So if you have negative frequencies and positive frequencies, it's fine. So let's see. So FC, FC new is, a, oh, sorry. FC, FC new is 100. Okay, so this here is 20. This here is 20, right? Okay? So these are the two possible frequencies I would have. So if I calculate this, right, if this becomes FC would be equal to, let's see here, would be equal to 120, right? And here, just to make sure that we do absolute values, FC would be equal to 80. Okay, so there's two possible frequencies that we have. Okay? Because remember, when you're doing frequency mixing, what's happening is that you're going to generate two new frequencies, one at minus and one at plus. So if I have, you know, if I have one frequency at 120, and when I subtract, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get 100, and then I put a bandpass filter right where I need it to be, 
and then you can do the same thing for 80 as well. So there's two possible ways. There's two things that you can, you know, there's two possible frequencies that you can have there. Okay. So give the specification of the bandpass filter and center frequency and bandwidth. Okay, so there's two possible situations we can have. Let's just use the one that's at 120. Not 120, I'm sorry. We want the one at 100. Okay, so you're, so what's happening here is that when you have your local oscillator, you have to make sure that, uh, remember, you're generating two sets of frequencies. So your bandpass filter has to be centered at where your carrier frequency is because you want to generate a um, frequency modulated signal where the center frequency is at 100 and you want to make sure that it spans basically the bandwidth of the frequency modulated signal. Okay, so basically it's going to look like this. So what it's going to look like is this is 100 megahertz, right? This is in terms of F, this is FC over here, and then it spans like this, and the bandwidth is whatever the bandwidth of the frequency modulated wave would be, okay? So basically you can calculate that using, you know, uh, Carson's rule, okay? So we don't know this yet, but we do know the deviation ratio. So you can use the equivalent beta plus one equation here. So the bandwidth here, the bandwidth is, uh, let me see here, it was equal to 5,000 hertz, right? Because that was the frequency of the uh, modulating signal. So two times 5,000, okay? The deviation ratio was 10, right? That's the output plus one. So this becomes, let's see here. So 10 plus one, this becomes uh, 110 kilohertz. So this spans 110 kilohertz. Okay, so 11 times 2, which is 22 times 5, so 1110. So this would be the bandwidth of your frequency modulated signal, and then you want to make sure that your bandpass filter is centered where the carrier frequency is, because you want to remove, when you're doing the frequency mixing, you want to remove that extra component. And then that's what you have over here. So, and then if you want, for, for completeness sake, we have another one here. So this is minus FC, or minus 100. Okay, and it spans between 100, it spans 110 kilohertz. Okay, and that would be the question there. Okay, no questions here, right? Okay, good. So let's uh, keep going. All right, so I've got, uh, this is the, f actually, sorry. I've got three more questions to do. Hopefully it should take about maybe 15 minutes or so and then we'll get out of here, all right? Okay, so, okay, this is, this is the, all right, fourth question. As shown in figure five, which is obviously this guy over here, we have an FM transmitter that consists of a narrow band frequency modulated stage or what's known as an FM exciter stage. We have a three times frequency multiplier, an up converter. So up converter means that you are making, you are basically uh, choosing the mixing where you're doing plus, right? So what it means by up converter is that you are choosing, you know, uh, you know, F of C plus F C nu, right? So you're doing the, you're doing addition instead of subtraction. Okay, so that's what we're doing here with the bandpass filter. And then a two times frequency multiplier right over here. And then we also have a three times frequency multiplier. So the oscillator has a frequency of 80.015 megahertz. So we have a oscillating frequency of 80.015 megahertz. Okay. The bandpass filter is centered around the carrier frequency, which is located at approximately 143 megahertz. So the center frequency here, so the center frequency is approximately 143 megahertz. We don't know exactly, but we'll figure that out. So the FM exciter has a carrier frequency, which is 20.9557 megahertz and a peak deviation of 0.694. So let me see here. So it's frequency, okay, so, okay. So what this is telling us here is that the output, the FM exciter, so has a carrier frequency. Okay, so what this is telling us here is that the input is, has a carrier frequency of 29 points, so this carrier frequency is 20.9957, okay? And a peak deviation, delta F, of 0 0.694 kilohertz, okay? So the bandwidth of the audio signal is three kilohertz. Okay, so that is the bandwidth of the message. All right. Oh, son of a bitch. Hold on. Let me just pause this. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right. Yeah. Okay. So here's the first question for you. So A, find, so let me go full screen. 
find, uh, let me see here, the carrier frequency and the deviation ratio, not the deviation ratio, but the uh, peak deviation at B, C, D, E, and F. Okay, so we know at A, at part A, that's already given to us, so we know that the carrier frequency is 20.9957 megahertz and the deviation is 0 0.694 kilohertz. Okay, at part B, we have a frequency multiplier. So that means you're multiplying everything by three. Okay, so when you multiply everything by three, what's gonna happen is that you'll get 20.9957 times three, which is equal to 62.867. Okay, and then you do the same thing for the deviation ratio as well. So this is 0 0.694 times three, okay? Which is equal to 2.082 kilohertz. All right, so that's B. Now at C, this performs an up conversion. So what you have to do is you have to take your previous frequency and you have to add this with whatever carrier it is at 80.015. So this becomes 62.867 megahertz plus 80.015 and when you calculate this this becomes 142.8821 which uh, which makes sense because the bandpass filter they said it was centered at around 143 so this is actually 142 which is nice and then the delta f stays the same a frequency mixer doesn't change the deviation ratio or the uh, maximum deviation maximum frequency deviation so that's fine okay now part D, okay, basically you want to multiply by two and then you want to multiply by three again. So F of C is simply 142.8821 and you have to multiply this by two. And when you do that, that becomes uh, 285.7648, okay? And the delta F stays the same, not stays the same, but it's 2.082. When you want to multiply this by two, we get uh, 4.164. Okay, and then finally the last stage is you multiply by three again. So FC is equal to 285.7648. You have to multiply this by three and what we get is 80, 857. Wow, that's pretty large. That's all right, I guess, part of this question. 994 megahertz. And then finally delta F is just the previous, which is 4.164. You multiply that by three, and we get 12 point something, I think. So 12.492. Okay, so that's that. That's the end of that. So E and then, uh, sorry, D, A, B, C, D. Okay, one minute, A, D. Oh, bandpass filter, right. Okay, C and D is pretty much the same thing. So, yep, so the C and D are pretty much the same. Yep. So C and D are saying the same thing because at this point, you know, you have your carrier frequency, you actually have two of them, and then after you do the bandpass filter, you get that. So if you want to be actually complete, um, so what's going to happen is, let's see here. So, okay, so let me see here. So this, so this is C, so this would be the result of D. You can also have, you know, uh, 67, 62.87 subtract 80.015, which is equal to 2. I guess uh, 0.82, which is not what you want, right? So that's actually what appears there. So C, you get two things, and then D is what you get here. But either way, this is C and D. It doesn't change anything. So C, you actually have two frequencies, but then you have to, after the bandpass filter, you're left with just the 142, because that's actually what, uh, what the thing requires. So C, D, and then this is E and F. Okay, the next question that is here, and asks you to figure out what the bandwidth would be. So actually not bandwidth, sorry. So calculate the exact center frequency and determine the bandwidth of the filter. Okay, so let's see here. So uh, let's figure out what the bandwidth of the frequency modulator would be. So it's two times delta F plus B. And we know the uh, message is three kilohertz. That's the bandwidth. So two times 12.492 plus three, this is all in kilohertz. So we actually get uh, 
2.0, what's up, 12.92, I think. Let me see here, yeah. Uh, whatever that is, actually don't know what that is, actually. Let me just figure that out. Actually, I have the answer here, but it's wrong. So uh, let me just calculate that very quickly for you guys. So 12.492 plus 3 times 2. So this is 30.984 kilohertz. Okay? So basically... We have a bent, so our center frequency is, let me see here, at 8, 5, let me see here, so center frequency, the, oh, bent pass filter, sorry, you know what, okay, 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 I actually made a mistake. So this, okay, so, okay, let me just write out what the actual equation for this is. So let's, let's remove that. So it says determine bend pass filter requirements. I apologize, so bent, determine bend pass filter requirements and sketch response. So this is actually between C and D. I apologize. Okay, so what's going to happen is the center frequency is at, it's basically 142 because that's what we want at that point. So this is 142.8821. I apologize. And the bandwidth is going to be 2 times delta F plus B. Okay, so the delta F in this case is 2.802. 2.082, sorry, plus 3, which is approximately 10.164 kilohertz. Okay, so the bandpass filter that is required to make sure that you isolate this would be centered at here, so minus FC, so this is, and then it spans 10.164 kilohertz, whatever the bandwidth of the message, not bandwidth of the frequency modulated wave would be. 10.164. 164 kilohertz. Okay, and this is, uh, yeah, and this is, uh, what is this? Well, whatever, 142.8821 and 142.8821. Okay, so that would be what is required. So this would be F. All right, so that would be the bandpass filter you'd need after the oscillation stage because at this point, we calculated it to be 142 approximately, so that would be where your carrier frequency is, and you want to make it span the bandwidth of the uh, frequency modulated signal at that point. So there you go, and then the height of be one. All right. Okay, let's see here. Okay. All right. Okay, any questions here? All right, so I've got two more questions actually, and then uh, let's get we'll get out of here. All right. So I just got two more. Okay. Okay. So this is question five. So um, basically, so I'm going to skip this explanation here. But basically, we have this block diagram. We have two message signals, right? So we don't know what actually we don't know what these message signals look like, but we do know that they have a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz. So the bandwidth for message one has is 10 kilohertz, as well as the second one. It's also 10 kilohertz. This is a lower sideband modulator with a frequency of twice the, the 20, so this is actually 20 kilohertz. So what it means is that you are doing double sideband express carrier and then you're getting the lower sideband only. You add everything up and then you do a frequency modulation. So this would be a way to transmit two signals using frequency modulation and combining that with frequency division multiplexing as well. We also know that the modulation index is four, beta is equal to four. And we also have a carrier frequency, which is 100 megahertz. So we also have this block diagram that actually shows you how to recover both of these signals successfully, which is over here. OK. So this is what this would be. So you're actually using uh, a little bit of superheterodyne here. And you're actually, um, you actually have this logic here that actually demuxes and demodulates both. So the first question is to determine what the bandwidth of this combined message signal would be. So what is the bandwidth here? The second question is figure out by Carson's rule what the bandwidth is, and then we'll go from there. So the first question, it actually helps if you actually do some sketching. Okay, so let's assume, okay, that the frequency, so assume uh, the spectrum for each of these signals looks like the following. We don't actually know what these look like. But we do know that they're both band limited by 10 kilohertz. So maybe something lo looks like this. Okay, so this is 10 kilohertz. This is minus 10 kilohertz. Okay, so this is M1 and this is M2. So it looks like this maybe. Okay, so let's actually go through this one thing at a time. 
So when you do a lower sideband modulator, what that means is that you are modulating by whatever this frequency is and retaining the lower sideband. Okay, so after LSB modulator, and this is for message two, basically it's gonna look like this. So remember, what's gonna happen is that you modulate over by two, which is 20, and then this spans from 10 and 30. Okay, and then after LSB modulator, you basically retain this only, this over here. Okay, so this is what you need to retain. So then the next part is to add both of these things together. So which is basically you're going to add, so let's call this I and let's call this II. So you just basically add both of these together. And when you do that, right, so you're gonna get one triangle here and then a hump here and hump and then triangle like that. So this is 20, 10, 0, 10, 20. So the bandwidth is just between here and here, right? So the bandwidth is simply equal to 20 kilohertz. That's it. Okay, so it's good if you actually, you can actually theoretically do it if you want, but I like to prove it, by, I can prove it by sketching. So it can be, you know, the distribution can be anything you want, but we do know that each signal is band limited by 10 kilohertz. So if you're doing lower sideband modulator, what's happening is that you shift to the left and to the right, you capture just the lower sideband only, and then when you add one and two together, you get this combined signal by itself, and the bandwidth is gonna be 20 kilohertz, pretty simple, okay? So the next question, determine Carson's rule of the bandwidth. Okay, so that's pretty simple. So B, I need to determine Carson's rule. So Carson's rule is equal to two times the deviation plus the bandwidth of the signal. We don't know what the frequency deviation is, but we can determine an alternative definition, which is using the modulation index. This we know to be four. So this becomes two times 20 kilohertz, right, times four plus one. Okay, so this becomes five times two times, so that becomes 200 kilohertz. Okay, because you have five times two, which is 10, 10 times 20K is simply 200 kilohertz. So that would be the bandwidth of your message. Okay, so the next question here, determine the characteristics, the center frequency and the bandwidth of the RF stage. So remember, this is basically a super heterodyne receiver, okay? So the point of the RF stage is to have a bandpass filter around the signal that you want to, um, that you want to recover, all right? So they tell us here that the carrier frequency is 100 megahertz. So this would be, if you're remembering, if you're trying to tune into a radio station, the carrier frequency is where we have to center our bandpass filter, okay? So it's very simple. You have C and then this becomes 100, uh, let me see, what was it? It was 100 uh, kilohertz, right? What's that, 10? Uh, 10, okay, 100 megahertz, sorry. So this is 100 megahertz, 10 megahertz, okay? So, oh, so I keep tapping this and it uh, keeps losing itself. Hold on, sorry, let me just uh, pause this. All right. So it's centered at 100, and I need to make this span my bandwidth of the message. So, so it's gonna go from here to here, right? It's gonna span whatever the bandwidth of the modulated signal will be, which is 200 kilohertz. And then you can do the same over here as well. And then it spans 200 kilohertz. Okay. Sorry, full screen. And then the next question, determine the uh, local oscillator um, you know, frequency, and then the IF stage. So if you remember the super heterodyne, what it does is that it converts your frequencies down to, its, down to the local oscillation frequency. And then you have to have a bandpass filter that is centered around that point as well. So let me see here, the F0, each, okay, 100, and then okay, the intermediate frequency is 10 megahertz. Also we have to do down conversion. So therefore, FLO is simply FC plus F of IF, which is going to be 110 megahertz. All right? So that would be your, you know, that would be your uh, local oscillator. And then if you want to draw the bandpass characteristic, it's going to be centered at 10 megahertz because that's where you want to bring the frequencies down. And then this spans the bandwidth of the modulated wave as well, which is 200 kilohertz. 
because the point is to basically shift all your frequencies down, but the actual bandwidth will stay the same. So this goes from here to here, 200 kilohertz. And then part E. Oh, fuck. Okay, let me pause this again. All right, let's go back. Sorry about that, full screen. Okay, so design a demultiplexer or demodulator system that will recover all of this stuff. Okay, so actually it's very simple. So let's see, so I have stage. Okay, so what's gonna happen is the following. So we have our signal that's coming in. All right, so we have our signal coming in. And then what's gonna happen is that first, we're gonna need a phase lock loop because this demodulates FM signals. Because what's happening is that our, this frequency, this, this signal, even though there were two, you know, there's two separate signals, it was demodulated using frequency modulation. So this demodulates your FM signal, and then what will happen is that we can split this up into two different situations, right? So if you want to get the original, if you want to get the first message back, you can just put a low pass filter, and this will give you some, the first message multiplied by some constant, okay? And then if you want to get the, X, the other message, you can put a bandpass filter, right? And then uh, you would use a demodulator, right? And then you'd get the second message, okay? So how exactly this, you know, so I won't draw the PLL for you, but so you have this here, and then the low pass filter would basically be centered between minus 10 to 10, right? So it's gonna look like that, right? And then the bandpass filter, and what's going to happen is that you want to make it so that it's between minus 20 to 10, 10 and 20. Okay, one. And then the demodulator is basically just going to be a coherent detector. So I can draw that for you if you wish. So the demodulator is simply going to, you have this coming in. So this is tuned at 2 pi F0. And then the output is going to be a low pass filter. So bandwidth is f of zero, and then you finally get the output, if you wish. Okay, so that would be that's how you do it for um, demodulating well, at least the um, the single sideband part. So you have a bandpass filter, you have a demodulator that will make sure that the sidebands match up. You put a low pass filter, right, to make sure that you remove any of the other sidebands, and then you're finished. Okay. Okay, I got one more question for you guys. It shouldn't take very long and then we'll get out of here, okay? All right, so this is the last question that I have for you. Okay, so, uh, Sir, yes? What if you demodulate first and then you use uh, the Sure, yeah, uh, for sure. I, that, that actually would make sense. So if you demodulate, yeah, yeah. So actually you could demodulate first and then just do a low pass filter after that. For sure, yeah, that'll work. For sure, yeah, that's good. If you demodulate first, then what will happen is that you'll just get extra stuff, and then you just put a low pass filter when you're done. For sure, that works. There's more than one answer, so that, that certainly works as well. Good, yep. Okay, so this is the last question I got for you, and then we're gonna get out of here. Okay, this actually shouldn't take very long. It's actually just very simple calculations. So this is the last question. So a wide band frequency modulated signal is first generated using a narrow band FM modulator. Makes sense, of course. And then we're going to use frequency multiplication to go from narrow band to wide band. All right. So the narrow band signal has a maximum frequency deviation of 100 megahertz. So the delta F for the narrow band modulator is 100 hertz. Also, the local oscillator frequency here is going to be 10, 100 kilohertz. Okay. The bandwidth of the baseband modulating signal M of T is B of B sub M. So the uh, bandwidth is just B sub M for the um, for the message signal. Okay, so okay, that's good. All right, so that's pretty much it. So let's actually take a look at what they're going to ask us now. All right, here are three questions that we have to ask. So part A, given that the signal at point A is your standard FM modulated signal, determine expressions for points B and C using the expression seen at point A. Okay, so point A here at point A, and this is question A. This is A C cos two pi f zero t plus psi of t, and that's usually the integral of the message. Okay, so at point B, right? What's going to happen is that you are 
frequency multiplying. So what you're doing is you are taking your cosine wave and you are multiplying by n. So what's going to happen is you have AC cos and this becomes n 2 pi f 0 t plus phi of t. Okay? And if I do some rearranging, okay, and I can expand as well, I'll get 2 pi n f 0 t, right? So f 0 t plus and phi of t. Oh, you son of a... Okay, hold on. Sorry, let me just pause. All right, sorry. Okay, so that's what, actually what's going on. So you see here that the carrier frequency increases as well as the multiplication of your signal as well. Okay, that's good. And then at part C, what's going to happen is we will take your cosine wave, we're going to multiply the frequency by n, and then we're going to add these two things together. Okay? So let's see here. So uh, let's see. So B of t, yeah, so B, yep. So what's going to happen is that you have B not added, sorry, you're going to multiply. So the signal at B, so I'm going to call this B of t, okay? So what's going to happen is that the signal at point B is going to be multiplied by 2 pi f of 0 t, all right? So this becomes AC cos 2 pi NF0 T, oh, sorry, plus N phi of T. And then you multiply this by cosine 2 pi F0 T. So remember the double Lego formula, eh? So we have, two, you know, we have two cosines. So this becomes AC over 2 because there's a factor of a half. And then you're going to have, uh, let's see here, uh, cos, co yeah, so you're going to have cos A, cos B plus, um, what is it? It's cos A plus B and cos I, oh, hold on a minute. Let me just uh, double check the formula here. I don't quite remember. Hold on a minute. Okay, so if you remember, uh, let's see here. So we have uh, cos A, cos B, right? So it's actually equal to, oopsie. A half cos A plus B and plus a half cos A minus B. Okay? So we have AC over 2, and then what's going to happen is that we'll have cos and then this subtract that. So let me see here. So 2 pi n of 0 t, and then let's see here. Uh, let me just double check. Oh, sorry. It's, let me see here. So it's, uh, right, it's cosine. Oh, I'm sorry. There's, there's a multiplication here as well because it's multiplied by n, right? So it's going to be 2 pi n f 0 t. Oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Okay, so this, this is actually multiplied by n. I totally forgot to do that. So here you get cosine of 2 pi n f 0 t. Sorry about that. So you have that there. So what's happening is when you subtract, you're going to get this will cancel with this. So th this and this will cancel. You're going to get cos of n right and then plus cos of and then these two add up so you're going to get 2 pi 2 n 0 2 n f 0 t sorry and then plus n okay so that's actually what's going to happen there okay so 2 pi 2 n of 0 that's good all right so that should be it there good Okay, so we see here that we have a uh, band, you know, this is a baseband component and then there's a band pass component as well. Okay, so part B, if the wideband frequency modulated signal, sorry, let me see, let's go full screen, has a carrier frequency of 80 megahertz, determine the value of N. Okay, so, okay, so let me see here. So we have a band pass filter. So the band pass filter, so, at, so let me see here. So this is part C, right? No, sorry, this is part B. So after BPF, right, the second term goes away, so we're left with AC over 2 cosine of N. Let me see here. Phi. Okay, all right. So, sorry, bandpass filter, sorry. So after bandpass filter, this goes away, we're left with this guy over here, right? So this is a bandpass filter. So this goes away, so we're left with this one over here, all right? So when you go over here, we get AC over two, cosine of two pi, two NF zero, 
t plus n phi of t. Okay, so we know for a fact that the carrier frequency, the target carrier frequency is 80 megahertz, okay? So this here defines a carrier frequency. So 80 megahertz equals 2n f of zero, whatever f of zero is. f of zero, in our case, they gave it to us as uh, 100 kilohertz, okay? So we're gonna get 80 equals 2n 0.1. I'm doing this in terms of megahertz, right? So 100 kilohertz is 0.1 megahertz. So when you actually work this out, you're gonna get 80 divided by two times 0.1 equals n, and which is 400. Okay, so after the bandpass filter, we get this expression over here. The baseband goes away. So we have to make sure that this carrier frequency is equal to 80. So we need to figure out the right value of n to do that. We know f of zero is 100 kilohertz. You just substitute 0.1 megahertz in, because of 80, when you calculate this, you basically get 400. All right, so the last question, C, the bandpass filter has a bandwidth of 100 kilohertz, right, centered at the carrier frequency 80. So determine the maximum allowable bandwidth the message signal has. So use Carson's rule to do that. Okay, that's pretty simple. So C, find Carson's rule. So bandpass, the, uh, the bandwidth of the frequency modulated signal is 2 times delta F plus B. Okay, so this becomes... 2 and then the delta F, right? Because what's happening here is that, the, you know, the original, uh, the original deviation was 100 kilo, not 100 kilohertz, it was, uh, what was it? It was 100 hertz, right? So remember, so let me see here. So the deviation for the narrow band was equal to 100 hertz, right? We had a frequency multiplier of 400. So when you're going to the wide band, this is simply 400 times 100 right, which is equal to 40 kilohertz. So we have to use the wideband definition, right? So this is two times 40 kilohertz, okay? And the bandwidth of our message, right? The bandwidth was equal to 100 kilohertz, right? From before, so our message, local oscillator, no, sorry, that's the wrong question. Uh, let me see here. It's, uh, sorry, local oscillator, sorry, BM. Okay, sorry, so we have to figure out what the band, okay, okay, so we have to actually, we have to actually figure out what the uh, bandwidth of the message would be. Okay, so we have, uh, so this is unknown. We have to solve for that. So the, uh, let me see here. So the uh, band, let me see, so we figured out what the, uh, let me see here. So use Carson's rule to estimate the bandwidth. Determine the max, okay, so the bandpass filter is 100 kilohertz. Uh, let me see here. Actually, let me pause for one moment. I just want to double check my notes. I'm almost done. All right. So the bandpass filter bandwidth is 100 kilohertz. So um, that tells you what the allowable bandwidth is going to be. So you have 100 kilohertz. Okay, equals two times 40 plus B of M. We don't know what this is. Okay. So when you solve for this, right? So let's see here. So we have two times. So we get 50 equals 40 plus B of M, and B of M will be 10 kilohertz. Okay, so the question asks you, uh, you know, given that the pass band, the bandwidth of your bandpass filter, which is essentially going to be the bandwidth of your frequency modulated signal, if that's equal to 100 kilohertz, and I know that my frequency deviation is going to be 40 after you throw it into the, uh, you know, the wideband modulator, I have to figure out what this one is. And when you solve for that, you get 10 kilohertz. Okay, and that's it. All right, okay, any questions here? Okay, so that's it. So when you come back on Monday, it's just gonna be tutorial questions. So I'll try to finish up the course in terms of the tutorial questions on Monday. I hope I'm gonna try to go through as many as I can. And then Wednesday, there's no class. And then the next Monday after that, will be your final exam. And uh, I will by, hopefully by Monday or Tuesday, I will tell you exactly what to study and what not to study, so you'll get that well in advance. But Basically, everything after the midterm is what you're responsible for. Okay, so all the tutorial questions, all the lecture material, everything after the um, midterm is what you're responsible for. So I won't ask for anything pre-midterm. Okay? Sorry? No, it is not cumulative. I don't, I don't, um, I don't believe in cumulative asking because I've already asked you oops, all that stuff in the midterm, so there's no point in asking you that material again. So I do not enforce cumulative. So just study after the midterm. Okay, it, it decreases the amount of material you study for. That's, that's how I roll. I don't ask cumulatively. I, 
once I ask you stuff on the midterm, that's it. I don't expect to ask you again because I've already tested you on that stuff. So basically just study from everything after the midterm. So from phase lock loops onwards until noise analysis. Okay? All right, thanks, and I'll see you next week.